Okay. My thing was, um, I don't know if this is a, a form of gentrification, what I'm about to say, but um, talk about, you know, kind of getting on what he was saying as far as... Um, oh, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm going to take, I know, I see, but I'm going to talk a little bit louder. <clears throat> I don't know if this is relative to gentrification, but I'm speaking it from a, um, an entertainment point of view or a um, music point of view. Uh, you know, um, recording artists are, you know, role models, and they can be used, supposed to be used as helpful, positive role models to the community. You know what I'm saying? Um, but what I'm realizing is a lot of the music that's being promoted and, and easily you know, able to put on the radio and easily get on the videos and, you know, it's, you can easily get it out here is the ones that have uh, committed crimes, um, they, you know, they live illegal lifestyles, they, they sell drugs, um, they speak nonsense in their music, but yet they get all this money to, you know, promote that, that swagger, you know what I'm saying? Instead of uh, being intellectuals and knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable individuals to their community who can actually help their community and be a benefit to the individuals in the community. All they do is go to the community, do a concert, take the money from the people in poverty, which are the people who like them, and then they leave, which makes more money for the record label and the promoters or the people who are with them, but not really the artists in a whole when they're out there doing um, CNN um, interviews about how they were shooting at police officers or, you know, this is how I got noticed. You know, I got 15 million hits or whatever because I, got, I shot a police officer. And now I got albums out there talking about killing people and selling drugs and being violent and disrespectful. Okay, now, I want to start a business. I want to help people in the community. Who's really going to respect me? You know, in the local governments, when, they, when, they, when they've heard all this stuff about me, that's where all that comes in as far as uh, belittling the ones who can be powerful and giving them something to make them think that you won, you did it, you know, but you really didn't do anything. Because the only thing you did was make them, the companies more money, which they can employ, which everybody does it. It's not a prejudice situation, we all do. They employ their people, which is their family and their friends, which is the like-minded individual. And the person who's out there being the puppet is the person who's talking about, yeah, man, you know, I was out there, you know, I be smoking my weed, and you know, I be out there having, you know, I carry my gun, do what I gotta do. But in reality, I mean, they're not being intellectuals and, and being promoted and, and, and respected for the things that they could do, or possibly do do in the background, because they, they're too busy promoting the negative aspects of these artists. So I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, is that a form of gentrification? Ted, you want to answer? I mean, I, I, I feel like it feeds into it, certainly. You know, when, when basically music industry shuts down any kind of political music because of the messaging or the people that are doing the work, you know, organizing or building power in your community, you know, that's not good. They just want to sell records, and right now they've hyped up this whole gangster thing, you know, or whatever it is. And, 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 and like that, I'm thinking 94, you know, uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and all of that crap, you know, it's just, it's just it's misleading. Yeah, I mean, and, and I it creates. My son and my granddaughter <clears throat> to hear that kind of music if I got them on the right track. But then you have the, uh, the people, like I said, the intellectuals, they're not giving enough to be able to help the people that need the help. Well, I think because they haven't shot anybody here, they don't even sold enough drugs or. You know, done enough illegal, negative, you know, or stupid things to get them on the map. Because the people who do that, they get free radio stations or, um, you know, free public access. And they're not really given the respect, like, you know, HBO or MTV or whatever, you know, the cable stations that these people are getting, BT, or whatever these people are getting. They don't get that. So when a pe person looks, no matter what you're saying, no matter who you are, when you're, when you're speaking something knowledgeable, intellectual, you look at it in a different point of view because you're not on that station, you're not with that wave. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so okay. That's all. Yeah. So I got, I got 10. <clears throat> Jessica, Cardo, Mary, B. Ryan. Let's go. Um, yeah, I just had a few quick things. Um, for, for me, one of my interesting, you know, 
questions that I had for tonight was how is this space, the flying squirrel, a gentrifying or anti-gentrifying agent in its neighborhood? Um, you know, I mean, the neighborhood has is, is gone through mass, you know, uh, displacement as well as uh, physical and demographic change, you know, completely. I actually live in this neighborhood now. I live in Cornell, right? So that sort of leads me to another question, which is, you know, I know a lot of my neighbors, and I know that a lot of them have this very leery sort of um, mindset about anything that past Ford Street, right? The 19th Ward and the Plex neighborhood are like bad places, don't go there, you know? And, you know, just th this interesting sort of dynamic where, sure, I know my neighbors, my neighbors look out for me, and then anybody who they don't know is suddenly suspect, you know? And that's like a really dangerous thing to me, and I don't like that. Like, the, the neighborhood association guy for Corn Hill was assaulted, and my immediate reaction was, oh shit, they're gonna bring more cops in the neighborhood, which I don't wanna see. Like, people in this space have already been harassed and profiled by cops just whipping around the, the neighborhood, and it's, it's fucked up. And so the last thing I wanted was him to be like, going to City Hall and demanding that we get more cops to like, save you know, the people in Corn Hill, which is kind of upsetting to me. Um, which leads me to my next topic, the walls, or the erasure of you know, historical knowledge. So um, not only the Elks the Claw that used to be here, but not only the businesses on Clarissa Street that used to go all the way to the city, it was like one of the main hubs of African American commerce, but Bronson Avenue, which is now um, Samuel McCree Way. And who the fuck is Samuel McCree? I don't even know, I need to go look that up because I'm really worried about that. Um, and then uh, you know, the Clarissa Street Bridge, you know, Right, Clarissa? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is now Ford Street. Like, like just the complete erasure of all this stuff. Um, and then, uh, I, was, I don't know when Ford Street was built, but it, it just, it, I, I think of it in terms of like, the Berlin Wall or something. You know, just, it feels the sort of gaping sort of wall. And yeah. it just, it, um, it really annoys and upsets me at times. You know, just even thinking about it, just bothers me. I'm like, how can this space act as maybe a bridge between like Plax and 19th Ward and Court Hill and the city? And is that possible? And is that, you know, how would that look? These are questions I don't know. Which leads me to the last thing, you know, I know Ryan, you were talking earlier about um, finding out what the plans are and trying to get in front of them and, and, and stop them. And I think that's, a, you know, that's absolutely, if we can do that, that's awesome. But um, in a much more individualistic, smaller way, I, uh, I just finished a book called Stencil Pirates today, and there have been a massive amounts, amounts of like stencil anti-gentrification campaigns in like D.C., in Chicago, in New York, in you know, San Francisco, like in major cities around you know, the, the country. And I mean, just the idea of having like an artistic kind of um, response to just even publicly educate with art or with uh, stencils, I think it's an intriguing idea to me, and it's something I would like to sort of pursue a little bit more, but, um, wow, yeah, good, good well, thoughts. Yeah, that, that, that's, I, I gotta say something, I gotta, I gotta answer that. Because hey, Don, do, we have a stack, like, we have a, we, oh, we got a stack, we get, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I got you first on the list of what can we do, right, because that's, that's the next topic in there. Uh, Jessica, you here? Oh, um, so I'm just curious if, Someone, I don't remember who was talking about how gentrification can be used like in the form of like, manipulating uh, like tax money for schools or like uh, the availability to healthy food. So if it has the ability to do that, is there is there not a way that it can be used? I guess I guess it would I guess it would be about like who's doing it, but like could it not be used like to benefit anybody? Just like a general question, I guess, but. Um, I don't know, it w I guess, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, it probably couldn't be, but I just feel like because it's controlling so much right now, there has to be a way that if it's put into different hands, I just feel like if it has the ability to do all of these things, that there has to be a way that you can, like, regain control of it, I guess, but I guess it wouldn't be gentrification if you did that, so, I don't know, but that was my thought. Uh, I 
I don't disagree that money isn't a factor. Because um, this whole thing, uh, I mean, race is a strong factor, but the greedy oppressing the needy um, is the number one thing, man. If, if they see you're getting $100 um, revenue per house in this area, and if they do something, they can get them 1500 revenue in this house, this is how far they're looking. I, and and it's, a, it's just a matter of seeing it and seeing it early. I seen it before they got Clarissa. They, the cornerstone of this, of, of this west side here was the hospital. Right, that's the general hospital. And even over there, it was right there on West Main, right down the street there. When they took, you, how do you take something like that out of the neighborhood? Um, Ryan came here tonight with this thing. That's gentrification. They're mapping out the Blacks area there. They're also mapping out the 19th Ward. When you start taking cornerstones of a neighborhood, the schools, you're talking about two schools, 10 school and 16. They're, yeah, that right now it's just a school. Next they're moving out people. The people in Plymouth on Brooks Avenue in the building across from State Bridge, they moved them, already moved them out of there. Um, if you're on DSS, even if you were on SSI, you couldn't be in the building no more until you had to leave. Um, it's, it's, it's profit, it's profit motivated. Uh, and Sure, there's racism in there. There's, ra there's no place where racism doesn't come into play. But believe me, it's all about, it's, it's a lot. The money factor pays a lot in it. And I just, before I close, I just like to say is uh, we don't have to try to recognize. We've already recognized. I just heard two people uh, identify. He, ident he identified one, and then he identified two, which is the same thing. Uh, the Plex in the 19th Ward, man, uh, it's coming. It's coming. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's coming. So, um, moving to, well, first of all, the reason for optimism around getting at this is that this is, like, this is play place. We're talking about places, like where we stand, where we live. So it's not like we're talking about trying to organize like global capital, labor, you know, <laughs> stuff. I mean, it's where we live, so we can put our feet like bees do and like put our feet on the ground and like fight where we stand, right? Because this is place-based struggle, like so many people in this room have done. And so that's a reason for optimism. I think we should pay attention to the mechanisms that are put forward by the local governments with the whole technocratic apparatus that claim to be community planning mechanisms. So what, what is claimed to be a place for community input and planning, <clears throat> we need to like examine that and see what the purpose of that is. Is it just a cover to make it look like there's planning? Or is there really an intention and a demand from like local neighborhoods to truly plan their community, their neighborhood, and like figure that out. Because then that can inform how people who want to really drive change can either go in there and like take control of that place if there's hope for it, right? If there's the potential for democratic mechanisms in that place, then we can go and take control of that apparatus. And if it's totally rigged and just totally a show, then we have to, you know, name that and organize a counter mechanism. And then just real quick, um, I've been serving on the school board for this first year. I'm in the newest member of the school board, and it's absolutely true. If we look at the facilities modernization planning process that's underway, and if you look at the facilities that have been resourced and will continue to be resourced and not closed and those that are on the chopping block to be closed, it's totally, totally, you know, the rich neighborhoods have to stop with public schools, even though that's where there are relatively very few public school students, or even students of school age. None of those schools are on the chopping block, whereas the highest concentration of the poorest people who use the public school system, those schools are on the chopping block. And if anyone wants to, like, talk to me about like engaging in that and like arguing and you know because this is still a public input period so just like I was talking about public input for community neighborhood planning 
call us out and the school board if you think that's a whole play process. And if it is a play process, then <coughs> take it to the next level. That's, you know, it's, it's really, because there are people who, like I truly do want real community input. And there is, I, there really is room, because I know like how some of my colleagues are making decisions and they really are listening. But if there's not a push and an effective use of that relic of democracy that exists, then it won't happen. That's one of the reasons why we have to uh, make the community more involved in what we are doing. Not just the people here in this room, you know, reaching out to one or two. I think with all the different neighborhoods, they got its own problems. The different people, they got different problems. But if we come together as one, and even with the school board, with her, and the parents would kind of stand in and take back, first of all, at home with their children, being a parent and not the friend and going along with everything, maybe the police will keep their hands off of us for a minute too. We have to sometimes put, put what comes first before we would even know that they will respect where we are going with our children. I had had over 15 kids growing up in my house, some in college now, some do whatever, and I only lost one out of all 15 over the last 40 years, only one. But I'll tell you something, if we take it back, where we at with our children at home, and it comes from the parent teaching them what we know, how to deal with the police department, how to deal with housing, what we're doing when we lose our house, what we got to do, and come together as a community to know what this meeting right here is all about tonight and here. I think we got us of something that strength comes in numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think the more these numbers get more power, I think we can accomplish what we all here tonight trying to do. Because without action, even the Bible says faith without action is dead. We have to do something to bring this forward. You know, we can talk about it all day long and don't have no placement where we're going, but if we involve the community of where we're at, I think we can get something in. Because I'm not letting up with where I'm with, with it all together. Even if you have to go alone to protect your house, where you at, to keep these people from taking your house, the neighbor house next door to you, like Don said too about the neighbors getting together to know each other, what the neighbors does. We have to involve the people that surround us, the people in our neighborhood where we at, we need to let them know, educate them about their file might have the wrong signatures, what to look for, right? How to go to court with the right person, to get someone, if you go to someone that does not know anything, we're right back where we started. You gotta look for somebody who do know. You might not know, but he might know someone that know. This is what it's all about. I think if we can educate the community to what we're going, I think it will work. I think we can put some fire on this. I think so. Okay, Brian, last one sec before we move on to our sort of next part, which is taking action. Oh, did you wanna talk before the taking action or the about the action? Well, Okay, so Ron, maybe you could just talk and maybe you could sort of transition us I, mean, I mean, that's basically what I was going to try to do. I wanted to maybe just write up on the board maybe here. Some, I, I, people have already said some stuff. I just haven't had a pen, so I've taken it all down. But maybe we can just write up some, like, concrete action that we want to take and put in the element of taking action. Because I think we've had a really violent discussion and... modernization project of the schools. I heard Liz talk about um, community land trusts, which I think would be good to talk a little more about that as well. I heard um, um, community involvement. Community, I'll put down community involvement. With an emphasis on the networking the individual communities by locales. How would you how would you put that locality? Uh, neighborhood development. <laughs> 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 so focus on where you're at, like where you're at. Yeah. Kind of 
yes. Is that, is that accurate or not? Focus on the... Like starting from where you're at or not? What do you, what do you... I'm trying to capture what you're saying. <laughs> well, oh, fine. I, what I'm envisioning is like a uh, kind of almost... I know social network is tricky, but like a, a local, a highly localized social network. Uh, yeah, where you're at, you know, it should, which is hard for me because I'm over there and I don't really care to organize that, that neighborhood as much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, publicly exposing and confronting. Neighborhood master plans. Isn't that black stuff that you were showing supposedly a result of that? Yeah, that that be. So that was what made me do that. <coughs> Which part? Like flats is supposedly aren't they supposedly undergoing a, right. a, like really decentralized planning? Well, process supposedly, but we'll say at the meetings, those businesses which are slated to be vanished off the face of the earth, weren't they weren't part of that planning. So. So that's my point. <coughs> so like, like, is it so? If they were there, would they have been able to, you know? So those kind of questions, like how? Right. So maybe, I think, I think you this may relate to what you're talking about, like more democratic. Right, and I'm not assuming that if they were at the table, it would have been okay. I'm sort of suspending judgment, like just asking the question. Because if, if it would have made a difference, then you'd want to promote everyone's involvement. And if it's rigged, then you want to call it out as rigged and can't come at it another way. So I'm just, I'm just taking some time, but those are some of the ones I remember we can keep adding more. Okay. So I have a stack that's uh, Carly, Don, Mo, Chris, Lee. I'll put myself on the bottom. Is it that last one? Get on, Susan. So this is about action. Yeah, I'm gonna raise this part at the top. We're just talking about. Uh, and I'll, Carly, why don't you go? Since here, you have a first time. Yeah, I'll, I'll be short and sweet. I think one of the worst outcomes of gentrification is starving people from education. So basically you're starving what they do know, you're taking away what they, they're not educated on. It's one of the worst things. Also to combat that is education. So I think one of the most simple actions you can do is go talk to people within your community. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your family. There's so many people that don't even know simplistic natures of this. I mean, if you want numbers, you have to educate people. So many people don't know. I think one of the most interesting things that I'm witnessing is I'm sitting in a classroom right now, or graduating class, of at least 50 people that are that are social workers. They have all these helping conditions to them, right? But what are they gonna actually go do once they get out? I mean, if this knowledge is even shared through a presentation, that could spark at least five people to think about it. You know, I, I just think it's that little bit right there. Okay, um Ted had Ted was saying some stuff about you know um you know about you know the purchase of squirrel and how you know he had questions to some things that I guess were basically effects. But what I was going to say to Ted was, I thought the question that you asked wanted an answer. And that is that, for example, with this, this very building, this very building was put up by some uh, black elks or, you know, they built this building from scratch. They built it to their liking from concrete and whatever else they used. Um, and with the city gentrification piece, I guess when the city basically took this building from it, it caused it caused a lot of uh, a lot of animosity to them because for the for the simple fact when they built this building, it's, it's just like a person building a house. You know, you know what you're going to put in for it to last. There were uh, jazz bands that used to come in here, well-known musicians. So when they lost this building, 
Um, and I, I think those people play a very significant piece as to a lot of the history and the answers that Ted was even answering, you know, asking, you know. So I, I think to try to bring them to the table would be a, a, a perfect thing to do. You know, I, I don't know if they would feel, because they're kind of pissed off about the way in which the building was taken, even though they understand that whoever bought the squirrel, you know, had nothing to do with the process. It was just the way in which the process was done, where they couldn't come back and bid on the building, and they got tricked, because there was some other dynamics that played into it, too. But my thing is, I think that if, if, if Ted, who you guys that own this squirrel now, if you could reach out to them some way, shape, or form, and if we can sit everybody down at the table, I think that a lot of the stuff that you're asking to be answered can be answered. Got it. Mo? Um. So that's an action. Yeah. So what did you say? Dialogue with former. Um, Invite them whether, um, you know, whether you do it here or somewhere else. I mean, because I know they have a lot of missing pieces to this thing as far as the stuff that Ted was asking earlier. You mean invite them again? <laughs> invite them whether again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just this is just small. Um, schedule programming. This is you know schedule programs where people can come and get the education that they need. You know for um, certain issues that you know we all know about that are broken down into parts. Okay. Next is uh, Chris. So. Uh, Carly mentioned education, um, which I think is a really important one. And I just wanted to mention the, the free school, which is looking to revitalize itself. Um, related, to, I studied urban planning and policy a little bit, and um, there's a lot of open access literature relating, recently at least, relating to how planners and policy makers actually go about um, implementing social control and dispossession, disenfranchisement. And I know that's something I want to talk about as a possible syllabus thing in the upcoming meeting. So Saturday here, this coming Saturday, free school organizing meeting, come to it. Two to four. If you want. Two to four. Two to four. That's it. Lee? Oh. I like you. Uh, and organizing on with her yeah. education, the people, the neighborhood, the public. You can stop all of the gentrification. I stopped it by myself for a while. Okay. You have to have information, someone to get information of what's going on and you document all of that information. When you go to these meetings, or you go to the neighborhood, you got something to show. <coughs> Even literature passing out to each one's house a week by week. I did this with RG and E. I broke them down. When I say broke them down, when they were charging each neighborhood different prices, I have all my paperwork and everything to show. Okay, where if you were the Caucasian, you lived over here, you only paid two dollars a month. Hispanics, five dollars a month. Blacks, twenty dollars a month. If you all back in there, it was uh, something like twenty to forty percent more than the Caucasian paid for R G and E. So I did a lot of research talking to people. People will help you, but they won't put their face out in the public. If you say I did it, no, I didn't. So what you have to do is keep what you ask them to do for you private. And don't say who did it to you. But you can stop the gentrification in its tracks by education, the public. Going from house to house, inviting them to meetings, 
even a little bit of threat. If you don't come to the meeting, no act for no help. That's the way I was. Person come running to me and man, my dad's the lady bill was two hundred and some dollars. I say, well, did you come to me? I can't help you. Only way I can help you if you come to me. So after that, they would come to the meeting, okay? Then you have to watch the person they plan in your organization, uh, in your meeting. Because they come there, they're gonna take notes and they're gonna run back. And 90% of it, they're gonna steal your ideas. <laughs> they definitely will steal them from you. And they'll jot them down. When you hear them, you say, oh, we did that last week. What happened now? Then you start to think about everybody in the room with you. Uh, we used to see you at, uh, meet at rg &E on West Avenue. And I used to tell the group, we shouldn't meet you. But when you get a vote, the majority win, you have to go along with it. So that's what we did. We went along with it. And uh, my part was something similar to this here. And uh, creating jobs. Well, I had got four tenant agreement. Kodak, Zero, General Motors, and Marshall One. Each one of them was going to give a contract. I can hire a hundred people beginning. And once you start that, then after I got that agreement and going on, then I had a building to buy. Instead of buying the building, Mayor Johnson and a few more people wanted to give me a building. Okay, so I refused to accept the building. I said because it would become a conflict of interest of what we are trying to do, but the members now take the building, you deny and everything. I become the enemy. So after that, what happened was he got the building, he said, okay, give me a hundred dollars. I gave him a hundred dollars. Then one of the politicians came along and said the building was lost to him. We lost it. So we lost the tenant agreement for the contract. So in order to stop gentrification, everybody in here, you have to commit. Like we had a committee for each individual thing that we were doing, and one that meant each individual had to meet back and bring the information back, and we worked from there. But it's not hard to do. Because uh, they won't show you, as Ryan was talking about, they just open and everything. But you have to watch the thieves. And you got to be careful who you talk to about what your plans are. So that's about all I have to say about starting this year off on the right foot. Lee, Lee, real quick, could you say what, what kind of organizing was it? Was it uh, against rate hikes with RG&E or? It was against rate hikes oh. with RGE, yes. Because they was uh, charging people not by what you use. I proved that myself. It's not about what you use, it's about what you live in. Live at and how many people's on social service, how many people's a house got burned down, all kind of service in that community, what they got, how many houses got broke into, and it's yeah. do that. And I also found out rich people don't pay gas in lectures. <laughs> I found that out also. So in terms of steps for us, it sounds like organizing, building stronger in organizations. Uh, you are, you're not going to get in place unless you organize. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got uh, <coughs> Susan next. Um, one thing, a couple of things I was thinking of is, of course, uh, media. Um, you know, using the tools that are already established, but maybe even um, creating new ones, you know, providing stuff for public access regarding the issues and, and talking and, and, and presenting that, you know, registering new media, other media sources that are um, independent and open to this kind of stuff. Um, also, I was thinking um, of house parties or 
parties within the communities rather than, you know, it's great to have a meeting here, but to take it into the neighborhoods, take it into the, the, the area, and, and try to get, you know, a small group and, and really talk about it and, and discuss it um, in, in a way that maybe is, is um, will get people more involved than having to come to like a place here but take it to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, action item. Um, instead of uh, giving, I, I just heard on the news a couple, three, four weeks ago, a month ago, a developer um, was, his argument was they only wanted to give him 10 years of tax breaks and he wanted 25. <laughs> uh, I'm, and, and I think he's winning that. Um, the thing is, to stop some of the gentrification, they need to target an area, say the 19th Ward, and let's do a 10-year plan of tax breaks for all homeowners. Let them revitalize their own houses. We don't need no developer to come in and build something and keep the money and only give that tax break to the people who own the houses. If you own the house and you live out in Scottsville and you're renting, the tax break don't go there. Increase their taxes, mm -hmm. um, but to the strength of the community will, is keeping those homeowners from moving out. It's, and, and if you want some accountability there, uh, just make them show you some kind of things where they're investing in their house or in their neighborhood with the money that would have went. I could imagine we could do a whole lot if we could get some tax breaks for this building. Instead of giving them the tax money, let us um, get some air conditioner or whatever up in here, man. You know what I'm saying? For real. I'm getting, if, they, if the powers to be are really interested in stopping gentrification, uh, give us some tax breaks. Not just the big developers, give us. Right. Instead of making us lose our homes, man. Give them to the powers. And, and, that, and we need to take these type of proposals to the powers to be. That's my action item. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to uh, call myself and then have Brian Carly Ted up after that. Uh, it's 845, we're, we're great to stop at 9, and uh, maybe we could just talk a little bit about future money mayhem, so uh, I just like so much to talk about. Hopefully we're going to be talking about future, I don't know, whatever, anti-gentrification work that we can do together. Um, so I, I'll just say that. But um, I guess what I wanted to say is just a pitch to be active. Uh, Ted asked this question, I, th I think the question is on a lot of people's minds, uh, you know, is a squirrel a force? Like for gentrification or against gentrification, and my feeling is we don't have to do anything. If we don't do anything, then we're for, for gentrification, you know? And a lot of gentrification happens from people not necessarily trying with the master plan, but just sort of, you know, living their lives and being part of that other person's master plan, you know? I mean, I've heard in the South Wedge, uh, a very prominent developer, Elijah, I don't know, I don't really know this guy, I don't know if this is true or not, but that, you know, he's targeting, I'm pretty sure this is true, targeting for his apartments, young, college, white kids, and not accepting other people. If, if that's not true about him, I know it's true about other developers. And true. I think a lot of folks could go into that situation not necessarily wanting to push out people of color from their neighborhoods, but just, you know, hey, I need an apartment, that's a cheap apartment, I'm gonna live there. Oh, hey, look, there's the colony next door, that seems like an okay bar. I don't know exactly <laughs> what the colony could mean to other people when they see that in, my, in their neighborhoods. Maybe I'll just stop at that, you know, without really, Knowing, and I, and I want to take away blame for that. I guess I'm not saying that they're blameless, but it's not an active thing that they're doing. And I think with us too, we could do nothing, and that could be a positive. It could be a pro gentrification force. It could be a negative force. Um, so, so we need to take action. And my small action thing is, I think a lot of people are talking about education, and related to that, I do think it's an educating sort of the gentrifiers. Here's the process. You're part of. And maybe for some people, for some people they'll be like, whatever, I don't really care. But for some people, maybe they'll be like, I don't want to be part of this. I'm not going to move into this, you know, house. You know, at least in some way, being a voice not to just push the sort of properties in one direction to make people really think about it. So I think that that's that's obviously not the most important part of education, but I do think that should be a part of it. Okay, so I have Brian Carly's benefit. Yeah. Um, 
that one of the problems, I think it would be good to have some sort of like a, a pledge that community organizations could take so that, you know, like I, I think a lot about like neighborhood associations, many of them are by default, they play, you know, by the different strings attached to get money from the city or whatever, they play into the dynamic of gentrification, whether they, whether that's where the people who originally got involved, maybe that wasn't their um, intention, maybe it was, right? But but I think some sort of um, some sort of pledge um, against gentrification for um, individuals um, and organizations where um, people can be accountable. So so some sort of simple statement that lays that lays it out, what it is, why we're against it, right? And for a lot of people to sign on to. Right, and then you know, and then with that being, um, you know, action items that people can do to resist that. Um, the other thing is, set up. I just wanted to throw out there is, is to actually fight displacement, which is what we're trying to do with take back the land. Um, and we specifically are working in neighborhoods that are slated for gentrification. And the third thing I just want to say is, is to sort of elaborate on this this idea of community land trust as. As Liz pointed out, I think is actually a instead of a piece by piece piece, but it actually creates some sort of structural piece where say within the land trust, people are going to come together collectively and say we want to preserve this land for affordability per permanently, right? It's actually instead of a piece by piece, you know, battle by battle, but um, potentially a structural way for I think there could be many land trusts, you know, and there could be one land trust, there are many different land trusts, right, by neighborhoods. Right, there could be 19th Ward Community Land Trust, a Pucks Community Land Trust. There could be land trusts based on ethnic groups for like a Somali Community Land Trust or a Black Community Land Trust, a Puerto Rican. Or wherever people feel there's a community, I think people can do that. And I think this is one of the um, best tools that, I mean, obviously it's, it's just a tool, but it could be run, if it's run democratically, has the potential to say, actually, here's the way we're going to keep land permanently affordable. And it, it's a way to prevent gentrification before it starts, right? Even if they have a plan, if people actually have land, people actually have power, right? They can prevent it, right? Because that's what it's about. So people come together collectively and organize through a land trust, right? To keep their housing affordable, to build, right? To have, um, you know, food, to have schools and healthcare, all part of the land trust, right? then it's almost like building outside of that structure to say we can prevent gentrification before it starts, right? So I just really want to throw that out there. Um, and this is something we're working on to take back to land. We've already started a shallow of a land trust. Um, so I just want to challenge people to, to work with us and other people to actually build a land trust, um, whether it be an organization that has land to join a land trust or Live, if you own your own house to join and to sort of see how we can work together to actually start building democratic ways to do land, democratic ways of having land tenure. I think it's like a huge discussion in itself, but I just really want to challenge us to start implementing some of these structural things along to, to stop gentrification and to building really democratic control where you say, well, the, is the community planning democratic? You know, it's always going to be tough if the money's coming from the, from the powers that be. But what if we just started doing it ourselves? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the challenge I feel like I want to put out there. Carlina? Um, I think it's a real specific action item, but it's tying together, Ricardo, you mentioned the 19th Ward, but in, I know it's with Chris. Chris, yeah. Never, okay. Um, mentioned asset mapping and really looking at the strengths and the needs of the community, breaking it down into all the little pieces, I feel like you're going to be able to see exactly what needs to be done. And until all those, you know, it's really, really looked at, it's not going to be as organized. It, it's, you know, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, I just, I feel like you really have to get in there and see just for this area, what is happening right there? What can, you know, those individuals, pe these people that live there, do? I mean, they might, again, it goes back to education, but they might not even be aware or knowing what's happening. I'm going to assume most likely we don't. You know? 
Uh, first of all, Ricardo, I love the idea of demanding that the city give tax breaks to homeowners and impoverished neighborhoods to let them, you know, improve their their houses and their their properties. Um, and I think that it'd be really interesting to find out how much money this developer is going to get for 25 years, and then compare them with the taxes people pay, let's say, in the 19th ward, and then you know juxtapose those numbers like how many homes could you help versus this one developer getting all this money to develop one specific area, and then use those numbers as a way to educate people in the neighborhood about you know some of the realities. Like, hey, if we put out this plan, and the you know, city instead of giving tax breaks to one developer, gave tax breaks for home improvement for like you know a thousand residents. Like, what would that do? Or you know, ten thousand or a hundred thousand residents. What would that do? You know. So I think it's a really, really cool idea. Um, and then going along with that, uh, next Monday Mayhem, we're going to be doing uh, looking at uh, worker justice. And two elements there are. Uh, firstly, like living wage campaigns, like how do we get it so that local businesses that are able to afford it can pay workers a living wage? Um, and then secondly, how do we develop like worker-owned co-ops where people in uh, the community actually who need employment can develop employment, maybe through micro, uh, you know, uh, Micro loan management or something like that, like you know, develop, uh, figure out what the needs are of the community, and then develop a plan to go about creating a, a business that's democratically run, where they all have power to run the business and be a part of the business and help build the economic infrastructure of neighborhoods that are impoverished. So, those are just some interesting thoughts. Okay, so it's 9:55, and thanks, Ted. You did half of what I was hoping to do before we finally finish up, which was introduce the next Monday Mayhem. So that's one month from now, uh, March 4th, Monday, first Monday of every month, there'll be a different topic. Um, and then I guess the other half is we have like this awesome list of like things that we could do, but how are, are we actually gonna, gonna do them? Do we wanna create an email list? Are we working through Take Back the Land or some other existing group? Or are we trying to just, you know, work, work ourselves, go our separate ways and, and work? I mean, how, do, how are we gonna work together to, to do this? And we only have five minutes, so I mean, obviously, we're not going to build an organization in five minutes. But you know, just how? What's the first step that we can do to make sure that we keep keep on this? So. Uh, I think the best thing to do take take back the land has already taken the, the the lead on a lot of these issues. So I think that if anybody's interested, they should just piggyback in with take back the land and just go forward rather than to start from scratch or whatever and just go. When does take back the land meet? Every Wednesday, seven o'clock here. Um, are those meetings like pretty much all the same? Like, is there a general meeting and then like working meetings afterwards? Like, what would be a good first meeting to go to? As far as we call, so two days from that Wednesday. So yeah. just the nearest, the closest one. Yeah. Uh, Ted, I mean, maybe something that could be connected with Take Back the Land or connected with the Squirrel or. Uh, just, uh, I'm thinking like an a anti-gentrification group. Uh, maybe to start with just an email list. I know emails suck. I get a thousand of them every day, and you know I don't always keep up on them to the best of my ability. But uh, just as a way to stay in touch, to keep in touch, to maybe discuss these issues within that context, but also to, like Don said, like, hey, I want to like get involved in something right now, like take back the land, you know, and then like these all funnel in the same sorts of issues, so it's not like you're doing anything differently. But I know that Take Back the Land's also got its own sort of focus, and they're, you know, my understanding is a lot of those meetings are very focused on, like, you know, the work that they're doing with helping people either defend their homes or get into homes, you know? And um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious to, like, sort of look at other models or, or, or other ex examples of gentrification and start doing some of these action items, like, you were talking about asset mapping, and you know, there's, um, there's just we have this whole list up there of things to do, which would be kind of cool to, uh, you know, focus on a little bit. But it's another group. <laughs> can I can I get a straw poll? Just raise your hand if you would be interested in being, I guess, on an email list, maybe as a first step to try to create a new group. Phone. Yeah. I, I just can it be strictly for like 
What type of sand? are not for everything, but what? for this. <laughs> yeah. Can I say yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the email list is cool, but I thought, he said that uh, they brought you groups before, like, was it like a little pamphlet or something? He says oh, something like that, and maybe people can get down with it. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, like, like your idea, like which is relevant to whatever's going on. Everybody, like you said, got their little ideas, but they bring it to the group. It's all part of the group, but we all have our own, you know, part, which is effective that we can, when we, you know, we bring it, we can network off of what's happening. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, I can do that. We can do that. Or, you know, there's different ways, and then we can break down the plan. Sorry for, for interrupting there. And I'll just say that I guess my view is that the email would be, let's get on email tonight and let's yeah. meet next week or the week after, you know, and then let's whatever, develop a plan, whatever, yeah, you know what I mean? Is dark. <clears throat> I, so I don't know, maybe we could do them both. If people are interested in Take Back the Land, I mean, the meetings are open. Definitely come on Wednesday if you want to do that. We could start a list of people who are interested in being an email list and continue to talk about it and try to form a different group. Are there other ideas? And I, oh my God, it's it's two minutes, but let's so let's be very succinct. But I got Lee, I got Jacob, I got. Yes, I was just one. They think two here. Oh, okay. I got I got Jacob, I got V, I got Chris. Um, I think uh, personally, I think a lot of pretty much everything was covered here as is like in many ways a direct uh, correlation with Tate Bank and Land. For example, there's already been a land trust in development. There's already uh, work in development uh, for developing a grant to do um, to do asset like to do information data mining and collecting it and putting it together. There's already people looking looking at weekly at the at the uh, city roles for um, what do you call it for foreclosure and you know being able to know where what is happening. I think the organizational structures are already in place, so to personally to do another one might not be. And then you have other groups that are, that are working with, uh, like the free school. The free school is looking to do weekly education programs or daily, I mean, you, uh, more organized education programs and potentially doing, uh, you know, talks at various schools and pushing and working with the possibility of giving presentations. Um, so I think the structures are currently in place, but we just need to continuously network better. We need to we need to know what each other are doing because you know I didn't know I didn't know what everybody's doing. I know what a lot of people are doing, and it helps when you know who to get in touch with when you have a good idea. And I think that the idea you were talking about a, a campaign to get tax breaks in li local neighborhoods is an excellent. Right action push that could could be show fruit or at least point out things. And V have Chris have the list. I think that's really that take back the land is in, in order. Just like you said, we reach out um, a little closer with the members, and know what each person is doing to get it together. I think that will work really good because right now it's a personal thing with the community. They know that there's some place they could come to talk directly in the meeting to explain their problems. Someone got time to listen. I think that's one of the key things here where you can trust to come into the meeting. They allow you a chance not all night to say what you have to say, but they will listen and they'll get together a little later to talk with you about it. And that's to give you a personal insight with your personal problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the key things to this, to get it started, to open it up to the whole community. They know that one person would tell the other one, well, you can go here. They would take the time to help you. I think that's the strongest part. I think uh, it'd be good to have a separate entity besides Take Back the Land, or at least network, to pull together, say, the preschool and other actions, but the, the anti-gentrification work is really like a multi-front thing. Um, and so, I mean, there's many different components that could be a part, and I think a, a step forward would just be a way to collaborate and know what different people are or would like to work on, and then a, a way to come back together at some point to be like, you know, I've been doing these stencils on this bridge and reclaiming the name and, or whatever. We could always be combined together with the different meetings and ideas. 
Again, again, Liz, and then. Uh, I just wanted to make an, an announcement about uh, a really great thing that's happening. Saturday, February 16th, there's going to be a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Fair, from 1 to 3 at the Public Library downtown at the big auditorium at the library. For all the farms in the area that do community supported agriculture will be there so you can meet the farmers and hear about what it's like and see if there's one that you would like to join for the season to get a whole season's worth of organic or sustainably grown food. Um, February 16th, 1 to 3. Sorry? Downtown Library. Downtown Library. Okay. Seems like we probably should have had more time dedicated to like actually what the next step is. My next step is I'm going to take this list that has my name and email on it. I'm just going to put it right here, and we'll see what people want to do with it. We can pass um, around. Yeah. Okay, I'll pass it around, and whatever people want to do with it, that's what people want to do with it. I got Don and Ryan, and we'll just finish it out with you guys. I'll cl close it out for tonight. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly think, and if, if, if this gentrification group could be used... Huh? It's an anti-gentrification well, group. What I'm saying, yeah, anti-gentrification group can be used such that you put some things in a dynamic, like for example, like Mary, for example, she's in the education field, right? Bring her in because that does affect children. Then you might get another person that might be out in the community that works with kids, for example, we're uh, we tying a lot of these things in that type of a group, you know, to try to switch things. I think that that might help, and then it still become a part of the model for take back the land. I mean, as far as you know, intricate piece to it to the model of take back the land. So it it it'll all work together. I think. I think we need a mascot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I, I think that every, everybody here I, I think is, should be welcome to come to Take Back the Land. I think it's you know, an awesome movement. But I also think that this anti-gentrification piece is bigger. I think it's a way potentially, if people were committed to continue to work on this work, it's, it's a cross-section of a number of different things. It's, it's, it's about housing, but it's bigger than housing. Right? It's about business and education. And, uh, and and food and, and everything like it brings everything. It's so so I, I kind of see this as intersection of a lot of different things, um, personally. But um, but I do think that take back land is a big part of that as well. So so I, if people are really committed, I think that um, I think I think it would be good to think about you know campaigns that something like what Ricardo was saying, some of these other things on here, um, and then just to finish up, I just wanted. To, and I would take back land. Just want to say that um, um, people are interested. We're, we are probably going to be doing an auction protest on February. Take back land. We'll be doing an auction protest February 26, 10 o'clock, um, at the um, Monroe County building, trying to take a, a woman's home over taxes over on the northeast side. So that's going to be a direct action potentially coming up. Um, you know, this is a black family lived in their neighborhood a long time on Cutler Street paid off the house already and um, you know fell on hard times. Her grandson was killed in front of her a couple of years ago and had a lot of hardship. And um, you know now she's willing to do everything, cash in her 501, 401k and everything to pay for her house. Um, the city sold the tax liens to American Tax Funding um, and, um, and they're trying to take her house. She's willing to put in a lot of money to keep her house. Um, so, um, be, you'll see more details about that, but that's just one really concrete thing coming up, February 26th. That's what I'm yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks Ryan. Thanks for coming together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.